yeah. Oh, that's... I got a bag of chips today. Oh, really good. Oh my god, I'm so hungry. Okay, so I'm ready for you. The extra 10. These are fantastic chips. Oh, no. We just like to dedicate with all the potato chips out there. They're fantastic. If anyone has a question, send me some pizza rolls. I can eat those while we talk. Okay, let's get started. Okay, so apparently I've been informed that I'm not allowed to actually eat chips and teach at the same time. Uh, apparently it's rude and distracting. I, I didn't know that. Sorry about that, guys. So anyway, <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm not going to eat the whole time. All right. I didn't even finish this chip, though. This was a terrible idea. Worst idea for the video ever, by the way. My wife just says, hey, why don't you just open a bag of chips and eat it? That'll be funny, right? I, I still don't quite get it. I don't think it's that funny, but she's like laughing her head off. So if you like it, I hope so. If not, it's probably just really annoying. <laughs> I, I, I would be annoyed. All right. Um, anyways, today we're going to talk about ODEs for uh, RLC circuits. Last time we had uh, a lot of stuff going on for our different solutions. So we were looking at second order systems and we ended it uh, with LC circuits. Um, so we're gonna go take a look at those real quick. Um, after we do that, we're going to look at homework number eight, problem one, and it's gonna give us some insights for the complex plane. Our, uh, the next thing we're gonna do is actually jump into uh, chapter 11 and look at general solutions for the RLC circuit with uh, those time dependencies in there. We're gonna start with the parallel example and then gl kind of glaze over the um, the series example, but we're gonna do a MATLAB demo in there as well. So if you haven't used MATLAB before, it's not gonna be an introduction to it. Hopefully you've used MATLAB in the past. Uh, if you haven't at all, um, drop me a line, send me an email and uh, I can probably point you in the direction of some intro MATLAB stuff. I think you guys have used it in the past, though, for some of your other required courses. Um, so anyways, and then we're going to talk about damping. And this is actually, it's like a footnote at the end, but it's, and, and it's the, for the graphic anyway. Um, but we're going to spend a long time talking about that graphic and what it actually means and showing you what these different titles mean. Okay, and uh, add a couple more to them, including undamped, which should really be on this list. So not three, but four, four cases, and then five if you wanted to. Um, I don't know what the formal name for this is off the top of my head, but basically it's just kind of wild where it goes out of control. So not four, but five, five cases. And there's only five cases. Um, I'm sure there's other other sub uh, classifications, but this one we really don't care about. This is where you get, uh, sometimes you can generate magic blue smoke in the lab. Uh, that's always fun. But uh, more, more nine times out of ten, where you really want to be is right here. And we'll talk about why. It, depending on the circumstance. You may actually want to be uh, in other regions, depending on what you're trying to accomplish. Let's take a moment now and go back through lecture nine and see all the solutions that we had to our previous uh, setups where we had just two elements in play. So you can see here for the RC series circuit that our input, our forcing function was this five volts here. And our steady state, if you run this out as T gets larger and larger, is actually going to converge to 5 volts. So effectively, you have some kind of uh, impedance to that. And this guy is going to start at 0 and gradually uh, work its way up and plateau at 5. Okay. Um, if you look at a, a typical exponential function, say E to the minus... 
a little, a little bit more standard decay function. It's going to intersect here at 5. So when we do a minus here, we're going to move that down. And it gets bumped up by 5. So this is what we start out with. Our voltage is going to start at 0 and come up and plateau at 5. Um, nothing interesting here. No oscillations. It's just impeded by the uh, resistance there. So then we looked at a RL series circuit. A similar thing happened here where we ended up with a solution, but for our current, where our current flow was, and of course, you know, we kind of had a DC, uh, where was it? A DC uh, push from our voltage there. So we had current that was able to flow through here and um, it eventually plateaued to uh, 20 and not much else was occurring there no oscillations just started off at zero when you add these two things together and then worked its way up gradually decreasing this term until it is effectively zero Now, when we looked at the RL uh, parallel circuit, so this is the graph that we had for that uh, voltage for the RL parallel circuit. So it has that initial push, and then it gradually decays over time. So it can't sus sustain or support any kind of oscillation or uh, sustained behavior without continuous uh, input from, from that source. When we got to our LC tank circuit, things started behaving much more interestingly, and that's a function of the second order. So when we got to our solutions and we started putting in these exponential decay functions, well, we ended up with the exponential decay uh, as an added bonus, right? So it started off at, say, 8 volts and then gradually decreased, but we also had these terms in here which we isolated um, based on some initial conditions. And we found eventually that it was uh, a sine and a cosine function for our rest conditions combined with this decay function. And so when we looked, looked at the plot of this, we ended up with an oscillating function. Now, that's pretty interesting actually but what's happening here is that this is what we call an undamped system to a certain extent it has uh, a little bit of dampening if you will but that's not really what's going on there what's actually happening is our forcing function is decreasing so where we actually get damping would be its end behavior right where does it go does it does it eventually converge down to zero? Does it stop isolating, or I'm sorry, does it stop oscillating at some point in time where we can say, yeah, it's pretty much done or it's stabilized at a particular voltage? Um, that doesn't happen here. It is undamped. It is unfettered by a resistor in the loop. So if there was a resistor in here, that then would cause this to dampen out. Okay, and the oscillations would just live inside of that dampening. As it is, our model didn't have any resistance in it. So everything was free and unimpeded in this model, and no resistance was accounted for. So here we also had a uh, forcing function. And this forcing function, on the other hand, was actually a sinusoid. And no surprise it's undamped as well because we don't have any restrictions to our, uh, to our, um, from a resistor to our system. So what we're going to find in, uh, the RLC circuits is that they have this oscillating behavior that we got from the LC circuits, but they also have this dampening that we observed or decay that we observed from the RL and RC circuits separately. So it really is a, a composite of RL 
RC and LC circuits all together. Let's look at homework uh, eight, number one. And this is something you should have already started working on, but we're gonna take another quick peek at it. Uh, I've already doodled on this. The reason I've picked this particular lecture to talk about this problem is this lecture is where we start to really dig in to the complex plane. And I want you guys to be intimately familiar with how it works and the best way to think about that space. Because it is a space. Um, just like the real number line, it's just got an extra part to it. Um, imaginary numbers, of course, as you probably are well aware by now as electrical engineers, don't mean that they don't exist. As a matter of fact, they very much do exist. And the fact that they were called imaginary in the first place is rather up for debate. Um, it was just a name that was sort of convenient at the time, um, but not really preferable. But there are other practical applications of complex numbers, and really their value comes into play when we need a number system that has two orthogonal components. And this actually developed out of an interesting mathematical group um, called the Hamiltonian, which in fact uses 1, negative 1, i, negative i, j, negative j, and k, and negative k. And it uses combinations of these things to generate each other. So one, you could do like a multiplication table here, right? And this is way outside of the context of this course, so don't worry if you don't get this. This is just a little bit of gravy uh, from having me as your instructor. One times anything is an identity, so you can just repeat that line. Negative one times anything is just repeating that. An interesting thing happens, though, when we get down to the area where uh, we have i and minus i in our multiplication table. You know what i times i is. It's minus 1, minus 1 for uh, minus i times minus i, right? And then it's 1 for i times minus i. You should recognize that. But then when we get to i times j in this uh, what we call a group, it pops us over into K. So um, if you're in order, I times J is equal to K, but if you um, say you do J times K, it gets you I. Um, but anyways, y you get the idea. Um, that's kind of where this is coming from, and it's just using a sort of subset of this larger group or subgroup if you will this is what happens when you let a mathematician teach an electrical engineering course you get way more than you bargained for all right guys so we'll leave that aside for now but know that those letters actually come from somewhere and that they're not just made up so let's get to the problem at hand here we're dealing with polynomials um, nth order polynomials which is equivalent to our ODE systems as we've shown in the past. We can basically translate ODE systems into polynomials, which is really damn convenient. But let's have a really simple polynomial right here. And actually, I want to start even more simply. Let's start with x equals 1. What's the solution to x equals 1? Well, it's 1. What about x squared equals 1? Well, that's pretty darn simple too. We actually just end up with x is equal to 1 or minus 1. And if I'm looking on the complex plane, this is what's happening. I take my unit circle, and as my exponent is increasing, let's do this in blue. Here's little boy blue. I have this point. And then for the next one, x squared equals 1. I'm going to take red. I have two solutions. I have this one, and I have this one. And as it turns out, what I'm doing here as I increase my exponent of x, it's just subdividing the unit circle in the complex plane where this is represented by A and, oopsies, oh, oh no, and BI, okay? So my two orthogonal axes are A and BI. Now, as I go up to X equals three, it's going to subdivide this even further. So I'm gonna have my first one, move a third way, third of the way around the circle, another third of the way around the circle, and that's all. And we'll see that in the solution as we get to it. 
But just know that all this equation is doing is subdividing the unit circle in the complex plane. That's it. All your solutions are right there. And you can ramp this up to x to the 27 is equal to 1. And you can easily find those solutions by subdividing the unit circle in the complex plane and just taking 27 little pie pieces out of it. It's rather nice. Okay. Hopefully you've seen this before, but for those of you that haven't, um, it's stupid important that you understand um, exactly where this is coming from. So, a useful identity, we start off with Euler's formula, and we get this handy-dandy critter, which for any integer k, all integers k, and an integer, by the way, usually represented by z, is just any of the numbers negative 1, negative 2, 0, 1, 2, etc. Um, z plus, by the way, usually we just call this 0, 1, 2, etc. And then your natural numbers are 1, 2, 3. You're counting numbers. Okay. Anyways, this is the set we're drawing from. So no matter what k I pick, this is always equal to 1. So I'm actually going to do a substitution. And I have x to the third. And this substitution is going to reveal why we have that little subdivision process occurring in our uh, solution to x to the n equals 1. So what we can essentially do here is use this equivalency and raise both sides to the third power and then solve for the unique values of k that give us um, different values, different outcomes for this expression. Our three values give us 1 e to the j 2 pi over 3 times 1. Remember, the first one is using k is equal to 0. e to the j 2 pi over 3 times 2, which is 4 pi over 3. And we can see the repeat happen when we get to uh, j is equal to 3, because then we have e to the j 2 pi over 3 times 3. These cancel. These us with e to the j 2 pi, which we know from here is equal to 1, but we already have that solution. So that's a repeat. And you'll find that for all the j's past 2. So when we write these guys out, we actually can write them out as a sine of 2 pi over 3 plus j sine of 2 pi over 3. And we know what um, sine and cosine of 2 pi over 3 is pretty easily. Um, so we know where they land on that unit circle. It's very convenient for us. And the fact that we have this j here allows us to write this in this, um, you know, j sine phi and cosine phi form, which are equivalent to, you know, our uh, a and our bi form, or jb, or bj, whatever form you want to call it, um, they're all the same. But we use sine and cosine because of that exponential identity that we have at play. Okay, so the best way to approach these problems with roots is undoubtedly by using Euler's identities. The third best way is just algebraically. And when we do the algebra without touching Euler's identities, it's kind of messy, right? We have all these square root expressions and everything. In addition to that imaginary component that we already had to pop in there. See, the beauty of Euler is that we don't have any of those square root problems. We don't have any of the weird um, forms or not well defined, you know, what if you had a, a phi in here that was uh, something you're not as familiar with? Let's say, um, let's say we had x to the seventh is equal to one. Uh, I don't really know the sine and cosine of that very easily, but, you know, I could express it as an exponential form and just leave it like that. And that's fine. And that's easy to work with. And computers can work with that too. So that's, that's where Euler's 
uh, equation comes in really nice because then we don't have to solve it brute force like this. But that option is available to us and there are useful identities for uh, some handful of smaller polynomials. And you can see that when we have x to the third is equal to minus one, all that's happening here is a reflection across the y-axis for our solutions. The final way that we wanna approach this is with MATLAB. And for MATLAB, all we're gonna do is just write the polynomial in a convenient and uniform way and then pop it into the, the meat grinder. So here we have x to the fourth is equal to 16. In order to write our expression p so that root p can recognize it, everything must go to the left-hand side, okay? Or right-hand side, however you want to orient it. It really doesn't matter. So we have x to the fourth plus an implied 0x to the third, 0x squared, 0x, and that 16 pops over, so it's a minus 16. It's all equal to zero. Set it equal to zero. Set it equal to zero. Don't leave your constant on this side. Bad things will happen. You will get the wrong answer. Okay, so the f this is looking at the coefficients of each power of x. So the coefficient here is a, a tacit one, zero, zero, zero. And for our constant minus 16, that's equal to zero. So we set that equal to p just as we've done here. Roots P, that command, will give you all the roots. It'll spit these guys right out. And bam, 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 you find these guys on your unit circle, you're good to go. Why is it equal to two? Well, the fourth root of 16 is equal to two. So effectively, what we've done here is we've taken X is equal to two and then raised it to the fourth power. But we're looking at all the possible ways that we could have gotten to that point uh, from our little rotational perspective. Okay, let's finally get to the book stuff and talk about RLC circuits. So the first example we're gonna to try to tackle is the parallel circuit. So we have I in of T. We have a resistor here, we have an inductor. and a capacitor, R, L, C. And we're gonna look at this voltage because this is pretty handy for us to know. And this current is a convenient term as well. Now we're going to use our continuity equations. And by now, if you don't know these, you're in trouble. But I know you all do. So we have uh, the first one is VLT is equal to L D D T I L T. The second one is I sub C of T is equal to C D D T of V C T. Now, one thing to note here is that Later on in the course, we're going to run into what's called the telegrapher's equations, which looks at um, basically transmission of a signal across a particular, um, what we call a particular model of a transmission line. And uh, it happens to be for the old telegraph system. Um, it was still relevant today, for sure, for a lot, of, a lot of different applications. Anyways, these are like a dumbed down version of those telegrapher's equations in a way. So know that there is more complexity at play here than just these continuity equations. Know that there are other things going on in a system that need to be accounted for. Okay, so how the heck do we even approach a problem like this? I've got three elements all in parallel. Um, I need to set up an ODE. I have I in of T. So my intuition says maybe I should use some kind of current phenomenon to be able to describe the system. Eh, in a pinch, KCL or KVL is going to do the trick. I have current. Let's stick with that and try it. And in general, when we have a parallel system, we're probably going to be looking at KCL. 
probably, not always, but probably. If we have series for our um, pet problems here, we're going to have KVL more than likely. This is not always true, but most of the time it'll, it'll work. So this is a good hint for you guys to try to approach problems. If it doesn't work for whatever reason, don't press on it too hard. All right, so we have INT has got to be equal to something. We're using KCL. Let's get to work. Our current IN is just getting split, right, over the resistor, the inductor, and the capacitor. So we just add those guys together. We have IR plus IL plus IC. I see, I see. We need to pick one of these guys as our variable that we're looking for, our X, right? This is our, our Y of T, our forcing function. We have some stuff going on in here, and it's a, it's a um, linear combination of these derivatives on X. But what the heck is X? What is our X in this case? So we need to figure that out. Well, what's a good candidate? If we look back at our continuity equations, I'm pretty sure it's gotta either be IC or IL. And in fact, as it turns out, IL is going to be our go-to for this. Um, IR is simply out because it doesn't really fit well in our continuity equations, quite frankly. Um, the other thing we can notice right away too is that if I daisy chain the continuity equations together, I can get from one to the other pretty easily. And in fact, IC is easy to transform into IL, not so much the other way around. So what I have here as well that I need to consider is that in this particular example, I can exploit the fact that V C T is equal to V L T. And that's just because we have this nice pet problem that we're working with here. But works in our favor. Let's use it. So we can rewrite this expression as um, we're going to replace that IR using Ohm's law. So we have V R, which is the same thing as V L of T over R. Plus, and we're going to leave ILT alone for right now because I think that's what we're going to use, right? And then ICT, well, ICT is just this expression here with respect to VCT. So we can use that. That'll work. Um, we go ahead and plop that in, and we get C, D, D, T, V, C, T. And by now, you've probably seen this show before. Uh, you know the, where this is going. We know that VC is the same as VL. Therefore, I'm going to block this off so you don't think that this is an equivalent expression. Um, therefore, we can replace VC with VL and then use our first equation now. So we end up with L over R times D DT ILT, nice, it's an ILT, plus ILT, good, we're two for two, plus C times DT of, well, VL, which is L, D, D, T, I, L, T, and through, whoa, that got funky, and through the magic of calculus, this guy can plop through, um, these two guys get combined together to form a second derivative, and what do you know? We end up with the following when, you're, when we rearrange everything. L, C, D, D, T squared of I, L, T uh, plus L over R, D, D, T, I, L, T plus I, L, T. And that's equal to our, our forcing function I, N, T. And we have a nice little ODE here now. We're going to go to homogeneous land. 
right? That's our next step. We have our ODE. Let's solve it. Um, if we get some initial conditions and everything uh, in place or a nice forcing function, we can actually solve this all the way through. Um, but for right now, let's go ahead and just solve that homogeneous solution because, eh, even in a generalized form, we can still do something nice with it. Um, and it's going to provide some really key insights for us for dampening and that whole concept. So our homogeneous solution is just 0 is equal to LC lambda squared plus L over R lambda plus 1. And for convenience sake, we're going to rewrite this as lambda squared plus 1 over RC lambda plus 1 over LC. And there's a darn good reason for this. And that's this. You may recall from last time that when we talked about the natural frequency of something, and I pointed this out, omega naught uh, was equal to 1 over the square root of LC. No accident here that we want to express this with a constant, or uh, I'm sorry, a, uh, our last term as omega squared. Right? So, we're going to see where this leads. Um, as it turns out, I'm going to cheat. You could do the algebra. I know you can. Minus 1 over 2RC plus minus these are our lambda values, by the way. Um, 1 over 2RC squared minus L. Oops, no it's not. Minus 1 over LC. Okay. Now from here, we're just going to have this be a placeholder for lambda 1, 2. Our homogeneous solution is I L homogeneous of T is equal to A1 E to the lambda 1 T plus a2 e to the lambda 2 t. Now, we're going to run through a couple different cases, and they all have to do with the um, polynomial expression. In particular, what happens under the radical? So as you know from algebra, if the thing under the radical is equal to 0, I have a duplicate of this guy for my roots. If I have uh, this, oops, if this guy is greater than this guy, I end up with a real value under the radical, or a real value from the radical, so I have two real roots. And if I have this guy greater than this guy, I end up with an imaginary, and they are complex conjugates. Our final solutions are two complex conjugates of one another. So these three cases represent the three cases we care the most about. Our overdamped, critically damped, and underdamped. Where overdamped represents probably should write this out. Oops. So overdamped is when uh, 1 over 2 RC squared is greater than 1 over LC i.e. we have a real value um, from the radical. Okay. Critically damped, as you might guess, is at that critical point. Um, that's when these two are equal to each other. And we have uh, two duplicate real roots. Okay, and finally, underdamped is the most interesting case because what do we end up with with this? Is uh, the following this is less than one over LC which gives us those imaginary uh, bits. So complex conjugate roots. Now recall what we said 
earlier that when we deal with complex numbers, what we're really looking at is oscillations. So the thing that's going to get wiggly, okay, is this guy because it's got these complex bits associated with it. That's pretty much the easiest way to think about this is imaginary stuff means wiggly bits. All right. I know that's super scientific, but, uh, and it's, and it's even worse coming from a mathematician, but I, heuristically, that's what makes sense to me. So I hope it makes sense to you. And in any case, we're going to look at it in much greater gory detail. So what we see here is that the resistor is the primary driver for determining whether we're in overdamped, critically damped, or underdamped, uh, as you can see here. Alternatively, just based on the math, uh, you could look at it from the perspective of the inductor. So this inductor, you could modify and tweak or tune that dial right here to change where it lives, whether it's critically damped, where the system lives, whether it's critically damped, underdamped, or, or overdamped. Um, so it's the play between R and L, really, that determines what region we're in. Because C is in both of these, right? So I could, there's an argument to be made here, but C exists on both sides of the equation. So quite simply, it's the play between R and L that gives you um, the easiest way to modify the circuit into something that is um, existing in a different different state. As we'll see for the uh, um, for the series circuit, however, this is not the case. What it ends up being is a play between not R and L, but R and C. And we're going to show you that in a MATLAB example as well as we change what value of C we pick. We hold, we hold R and L constant. But as we change C, we actually get, um, we actually can move between these different regions here. And so that's really pretty critical. And uh, another thing that we'll show is that when you turn the resistor off, you actually exist in this undamped state. Okay, so here is a picture of what damping really is. So we've talked about this a little bit. The undamped system is what I want to show you first. Um, with the undamped system, we have just a sinusoidal, could be sine or cosine really, a sinusoidal function that maintains this amplitude in, uh, indefinitely. Okay, and there is no assumed resistance in that system that's going to ever slow it down. And it's not being uh, pushed or prodded by something else to, to necessarily do that. It could be, um, but generally it's undamped because it's not decaying. In the case of underdamped, we start to have some damping, but it also still exhibits the oscillations. So you can see here, if you were to follow this the peaks of the red right here and right here, they follow an exponential decay. And so that exponential decay guides the, uh, the damping process, the oscillation process. And, uh, but we still have wiggles, right? We could also have uh, oscillations that aren't around zero, right? If you had some kind of state where everything was at an elevated voltage, for example, uh, and you were looking at oscillations for that, you, you may have um, oscillations occurring, but they're just up higher than, than where you're used to looking right at zero. So keep that in mind as you're looking at um, your outputs from a system. When we get to a certain point, we get to where we're almost having some wiggles, but not quite. And this can come in a couple different forms. Um, but at the very tipping point of it is what we call critically damped. And that's when we switch between uh, having oscillations and no longer having any oscillations. Now, what happens as we continue to dampen a system is that 
well, it's still not going to be oscillating anymore, but it's going to reach its steady state even slower. So we kind of saw this with the uh, resistors, right? It's got a steady state it's trying to get to, but as I crank up that resistance, it actually is going to uh, increase the amount of time that it takes for me to reach whatever steady state I am trying to uh, acquire. So in the case of, say, voltage, uh, let's say my steady state was 5 volts, it would simply take me longer to reach 5 volts with an increased resistance in there. That's all it's saying uh, for strongly damped. Now, for the, I promise we talk about the kind of wild case, right? Where, um, as it turns out, when we, when we look at this further on the um, imaginary plane, we mostly do business uh, on this side over here, okay? But what happens when we do business over on this side, right? So if we have critically damped, let's see if I can pull up this. Uh, image from the textbook here. Excuse me. When we have uh, under damped, right? We're just crossing the threshold to being totally uh, imaginary right here. Uh, just a J omega. That should make sense because E to the J omega is just a sine and a cosine, right? It's cosine theta plus J sine omega, uh, uh, cosine phi plus J sine phi. So it makes sense that that would live right here. But what happens when I actually venture over into this land over here? Well, instead of a decay, i.e. A, a minus, a, a decrease in where my oscillations are going, I actually have oscillations, but they're being increased. So they go wild. So if we take a look here, um, you can imagine going from the undamped region, but with something that's doing the opposite of damping. So we end up with where my oscillations start out and then they just get kind of more crazy and crazy until I get that magic blue smoke that we all know and love. Okay. That's one possibility. Um, there are other things that you can kind of do, but this is by and large the, a good heuristic to have in your head for what happens on this side of the, the complex plane. Okay. So that's what's going on with, with damping and what these definitions actually mean with respect to our system. Look at a MATLAB example for the RLC solution. And I know I'm kind of jumping around here a little bit, but uh, it's doing the ODEs at this point really isn't the focus. The focus is on the different dampening states that we can exist in and what that means in the complex plane and how we can adjust our uh, different values based on R, L, and C, i.e. I where do we exist in the complex plane based on R, L, and C. So let's take a look here at this uh, particular function. I found this online on the internet uh, where all the cool kids are hanging out and turns out uh, this guy's made a uh, and exactly what we need a series RLC circuit function so you can modify this and uh, if you want um, if someone successfully modifies this to be a parallel RLC circuit function I'll give you some extra bonus points for sure uh, toward, for uh, your final grade um, and and post that up on the Brightspace page so you know first person to get it um, it's there for you. So anyways, uh, when you have a function in MATLAB, anything you have interior to this function gets deleted after the function runs. The only thing that spits out from a function is whatever, uh, you have it spit out. And even then, um, you know, if it gets used somewhere else, it's, it's not going to go anywhere. So, when I run this guy, there's nothing in my workspace. So if you want anything to be outputted, um, you either need to, you know, design it in such a way that it does that, or uh, have it populate or print in the command window. So that's what I've done here. I just have all these guys, and I've used this particular 
uh, equation because this is our relationship between our two terms to determine what kind of lambdas we have, i.e. what region, we, what case we exist in. Um, so I have r over 2l squared minus 1 over lc. If it's negative, we're underdamped. If it's zero, we're critically damped. If it's positive, we're overdamped. Okay, and we'll talk about trying to get to um, the undamped state here in a moment as well. So here we go. What happens uh, here? Uh, actually, let me go and clear this out. So I run the program here, and I'm actually in an underdamped state, and that's evidenced by uh, the fact that I have these oscillations occurring, right? Now, as I zoom into this, uh, you'll continue to see oscillations throughout here because um, it's just very, very flat, but this frequency remains. This frequency does not go away. This is our natural frequency. So if you zoom in here, you can actually get that frequency to pop out at us. And you can see those here. Those little oscillations continue to persist at a specific frequency. And in fact, that specific frequency is 1 over LC, right? Um, so basically, as I change C or I change R, I can change where I'm at for my region that I'm in. So if I change my value of C to say uh, this one, you can see that I now fall into that critically damped region where these two things are equal to each other, i.e. their difference is zero. So at this particular stage, we've almost got some oscillations going on almost but not quite there it's so close so if I uh, if I turn down the resistance significantly let's see if we can get it here then we can go back into that under damp state because of that relationship I've, I've reduced R and now it's allowing me to see those oscillations. So you can see at this frequency, at this value of L and C, I've actually decreased my frequency. It's taking longer to go through a cycle. And by modulating or changing R, I'm able to induce an underdamp state. Now as I reduce R even further, you can see that I get closer and closer to that undamped state. Bingo. So as R reaches zero, the circuit up here now effectively has no resistor in play. So it's just our LC circuit from before, our series LC circuit from, from last time. Um, its counterpart, our parallel here, how would we get a system that just has L and C in it? Well, we would turn the resistance on this guy all the way up it would go to infinity. That means we, you know, cut it off. Um, so that's why we have R in the denominator here for our uh, other system. Right, we're comparing one over two RC, not R over two C. Um, and what this does is when R gets very, very, very large, this gets very, very, very small and we go to like this super undamped, underdamped, i.e. undamped state. And that gives us the behavior that, you know, we're looking for if we want to model an undamped system. Remember, all these things are just models, right? The real systems don't behave like this in reality. Um, if you're playing around with this function, by the way, and you zoom in too far, you may see some, some wiggles in there that aren't supposed to be there. Uh, that's a function of the ODE solver, which I suspect probably uses 
uh, sine, you know, sines and cosines to kind of solve for things, um, to put it simply. So let's take a look here. What else can we look at that's interesting on this guy? Um, right, we can change our frequency. So let's go ahead and do that. We can make L and C bigger. I'm sorry, make L and C bigger. That'll slow us down. This got really slow now. Um, let's make it really small. Let's try like, I don't know. Let's do six here and uh, we want this even smaller. So, oops, let's do that. Okay, there we go, super fast. So we got a much higher frequency by reducing these two values, okay? Um, and our resistance is still zero. So now we have to make sure we keep that relationship, but we have quite a bit to overcome here. So let's make our resistance, I don't know, a thousand. See if that gets us out of the, whoops. There's too much, it's too much to handle. I should probably suppress these outputs. <laughs> that would probably help. Oh, oh there we go. Okay, so that did not, uh, that didn't work at all. Why? Um, oh, it did work. It totally worked. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> so we're now in an overdamped state, which is what we wanted. Um, this is positive, so we're good. Losing my mind over here. Let's suppress some outputs. And notice what happens when we're in that overdamped uh, state. Let's go back to so let's go back to our original here real quick. Okay, so let's compare this. This is our totally um, critically damped state. I'm going to hold this graph on the side. And then I want you to watch what happens as I uh, increase the resistance value. But I'm going to, where did it go? Ah, here we go. I'm going to hold on to the figure. So I have another figure here. So I've increased the resistance by tenfold. And you can see here, it's kind of hard to tell what the heck's going on at first. But this is actually a very stretched out uh, horizontal version of this guy here. So as I get into that overdamped state and I crank up that resistance, I end up with um, something that looks like critically damped. It's just really pulled out. It's taking longer to reach that steady state because of the impedance is what's actually happening here. So let's go ahead and look at this from a different time perspective. Let's increase our time that we're looking at things by three. And we'll rerun this so you can see it better. Okay, now this looks pretty equivalent, except if you look at the time axis, right? I've increased my, my time axis by tenfold. So now what took 0.3 seconds or took 0.1 seconds or 0.15 seconds to get to a convergence now takes 1.5 seconds to get there, nearly. Um, our current doesn't behave the same either, right? It's, it's doing its own thing over here. So it readily jump, you know, it gets up to its state and then gradually falls off, gradually falls off. But that rate of the fall off is now 10 times slower than what it was before. Wow. Okay, so very powerful stuff uh, that you can do here with the resistor. And then what happens as you change these L and C values in the overdamp state is it's going to shift this around a little bit. Um, but by and large, these guys are just controlling that natural frequency for the undamped state. I'm sorry, the underdamp state that, that, we're, uh, that we were interested in. Okay, um, let's see. That should do it for the MATLAB. We mentioned uh, all the important stuff here. So 
go try to convert this script into a parallel L parallel RLC circuit function and uh, we'll continue on with the lecture here. Sorry for all the noise on this computer it's the audio on it's just terrible but that's the way it goes. Don't have MATLAB on the iPad. Alright let's finally dig into this graphic and really see what's going on here. So recall that when we looked at the homework 8 problem number 1 we ended up with solutions that look something like this. And this is why we we started with this today. Uh, J mega T, right? And in this particular example, uh, all these guys live on the unit circle in the complex plane where this is sigma, this is J omega. So in the book, we have omega D and sigma P defined for us. And they change based on which system we're looking at, which, uh, whether we're looking at the parallel RLC or the series RLC. And for our parallel example, we had uh, that sigma P was equal to 1 over 2 RC, for example, and omega D was equal to the square root of 1 over LC minus, well, I guess we could just write this independently, but uh, let's just oops let's just write this out here 1 over r c 2 squared okay so these guys were defined for us and they're different for our our series circuit but the point here is that we can rewrite our equation which as it turns out looks like this uh, into something that involves omega naught squared. And this is our old friend, omega naught squared equal to one over LC. This is consistent between uh, both of our systems, I think. And so I think you'll agree that this natural frequency should play a large role in describing our system. So what we see here, I'll write this up over here actually omega naught squared is equal to 1 over LC. What we see here is that this is how we show where all of our solutions are. Let's break it down one at a time. The undamped state, when our resistance either goes to infinity or goes to zero, depending on which system we're looking at, um, we have, in this case, uh, R would go to infinity, right? And then we just end up with basically nothing uh, for our sigma p term. Essentially, this part of our thing goes zoop, all the way down there. But more importantly, um, we just have now an imaginary component. Why is that? When we look at our solution here, if this guy goes to nothing right, if R goes to infinity in the case of the parallel system, then all we're left with is a negative under the radical, so we're just left with just imaginary bits for our lambda. Now, if it's e to uh, just imaginary bits up here, as it turns out, and the A is going to define this for us as well, um, but what we end up with is just a solution that exists right here. Now, in the case of underdamped, what we have is a combination. We actually have we actually have this is imaginary, and this is complex, or I'm sorry, is real. So the entire thing is complex. And so we have to live somewhere where the real part is negative, i.e. this side of things, and somewhere plus minus imaginary. Right? So that's going to put us on this arc. this arc around here, not including this uh, 
not including on the real line. So from here, what we can see is that our underdamped has uh, two complex conjugate solutions here and here, right? Our undamped system has complex conjugate solutions. And then when we get down to the critically damped state, we have two replicates of each other, right? This term goes to zero, and all we're left with is this. And this determines where we live for our two solutions. Now, as we continue to grow this term and bring it out of imaginary land, so this becomes real, we get two, two real solutions. And from here, they have to stay real, right? It has to stay on the real axis. So these actually split. These two solutions go their separate ways now. As this gets larger and larger. So that's where the, the solutions go. So you can see here that what effectively occurs in summary. I know this is confusing stuff. Trying to, trying to bring it all together for you guys though. So what occurs here in summary is for undamped, I'm here and here. As I get underdamped, I move down for my solutions. As I get to the critically damped state, I have two solutions on the same spot on the real axis. And then as I get overdamped, these two solutions start to split up and move apart from each other, staying on the real axis. Okay. Now, if I move into some other weird place, and I should have done this in the MATLAB example. Um, I don't know why I didn't. <laughs> it's fun. You can see it. If you turn R into a negative value, uh, see what you get. It becomes rather quite curious. So notice here that if R was negative, then our equation that we had... Here, now it becomes positive. This becomes positive. Presumably, uh, we have plus minus something over here, whatever. We live over on this side of the of the uh, the line. If R is negative, or if I guess D is negative, but I don't want to get into that. Um, well, what happens there is uh, we get some wild behavior that looks something like this where it just oscillates out of control. So, yeah, something to look forward to. You know, magic blue smoke. Okay. Or an alternate reality, <laughs> depending on how you do it. All right, so that should uh, do it for today, you guys. Um, I'll talk to you guys later. Thanks.